coming from a background of uh, that I do, you know, I studied economics. I uh, consider myself a student of the political economy of India and the world. This obsession with growth ignores some basic facts which even an undergraduate student of economics can understand and comprehend quite well. You can have growth, but you can have growth without the fruits of that economic growth, the growth of national income or the growth of gross domestic product, without the benefits of that growth being shared or distributed equitably or reasonably equitably. You could have very fast growth which benefits really the elite, the richest section of Indian society and that's exactly what has happened in the recent past in India and in many other countries in the world. But once again, there is nothing inevitable or inexorable about growth leading to quote-unquote development. So when you say development, you mean an improvement in the well-being of a substantial section of the population and not just a small section of the population. So despite a lot of tall talk about the need for growth to be inclusive, that for growth to be accompanied by distribution or even redistribution, the fact is that in India and in many, many other countries in the world, what you've seen is growth without distribution, growth which benefits the elite, growth which has created very few jobs or jobless growth. If you look at contemporary India and the way India has grown in the recent past. In the years that ran up to the Great Recession, which became evident when Wall Street collapsed in September 2008, India saw for the first time since 1947, since this country became politically independent, three consecutive years of 9% plus growth in gross domestic product. This has never happened in India before. If you look at the official data that the government puts out, for whatever it's worth, you'll find there have been particular years when growth has been very fast, but almost invariably it has been accompanied it has been preceded by or succeeded by years of low growth or no growth or sometimes even negative growth. That means a fall in national income or a fall in output. So the question that would arise is, in this period of time leading up to 2008 and 2009, three years India saw consistently high rates of growth. Then there was a dip in the rate of growth and again India's rate of growth of GDP exceeded by, exceeded 9%. So if you look at the first decade of the new millennium, for the first time in India's history, four years the country's gross domestic product grew at 9% plus. But did we create jobs? Answer no. Did we create jobs fast enough? Surely not. If you again look at the government's own data, however incomplete or inaccurate this data might be, you find that in this period of high growth, you saw job creation at barely 2.5% on an average. The data again would vary from depending on what data you look at or how you splice and dice the data, but it would certainly not exceed 3%. So at one level you have GDP growing at 9% plus, but the rate of growth of job creation is barely 3%. This clearly indicates that, that growth has not been inclusive. 
This period of high growth is also seen in India in the period between, say, 2004 and 2014, roughly uh, the decade of the two United Progressive Alliance governments, you also saw consistent and persistently high inflation in general and food inflation in particular at double, double digits per annum or close to double digits per annum. Once again, never before in the history of India during this period of very high growth, have you see, seen such persistently high food inflation? Now, what does this do? In a country which is already very unequal, as India is, what food inflation does is widen the gap between the rich and the poor even more. You don't need to be an economist to understand that uh, the poorer sections of society spend a higher proportion of their income on food in comparison with either the middle classes or the rich. So food inflation directly impacts the poor because the poor spend half or more than half, 60% or even more than 60% of the earnings of a poor family go towards food. And so when you have food inflation, which is persistently high, you make an already unequal society even more unequal and, and extremely so. So this has been India's track record with growth. Now typically those who believe in the virtues of free enterprise capitalism and those who believe in the virtues of economic liberalization, deregulation, small government, minimum government, all of them argue that uh, that Growth really is a solution to everything, including poverty alleviation. But this is a kind of market fundamentalism which believes that the market can take care of a whole lot of things which the market can't. It's never been able to take care of, whether it be in, in developing countries, the least developed countries, or in the most developed countries, or the advanced capitalist countries. And, and this particularly, these, these market forces are not effective and don't work when it comes to healthcare and education. And of course, in many other areas. So what happens is that in the obsession of political leaders or certain political leaders, certain uh, influential economists and bureaucrats and decision makers, and of course, corporate captains, that only by growing can we alleviate poverty, can we, you know, uh, sort of redistribute the wealth, the, the classic sort of trickle-down theories espoused by the likes of former US President Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher. I think there's enough evidence today across the world which shows that it never works that way. The most recent one being the studies by economist Piketty, which has shown that Despite growth, you can have growth in inequality. Despite GDP growth or growth of national income, you also have simultaneously growth in economic inequalities. And economic inequalities, in fact, feed into other kinds of inequalities, which include gender inequalities and caste inequalities and inequalities of opportunities and, and re reinforces them and, and makes it even more, uh, even more, uh, even worse than, it exacerbates these, these deep divisions that already exist in society. The, the short point is that without state intervention, without government intervention, in particular government in intervention in healthcare and education, and one could argue in agriculture, in irrigation, in, in, in job creation, market forces will not result in a more equal or a less unequal society without active intervention by government agencies. So in, in this mirage, the, so, so growth in a sense becomes a mirage, Your growth becomes uh, something you aspire for and, and you try and sell it to large sections of the population as if it's a solution for all your problems and your ailments. Uh, but it doesn't really work that way. If anything, 
it sometimes, or more often than not, not sometimes, but more often than not, worsens many problems. And, and in a sense, the more unequal a society gets, extreme inequality at the end of the day is also not good for growth. It's also not good for, for good governance. It's not good for the well-being of large numbers of society. I mean, the point is, since 2008 in particular, we've, we are living in an extreme, extremely unequal world. Uh, the 100 richest persons on the planet, their combined wealth would equal or exceed the combined wealth of half the population of the planet. I mean, if there are over 7 billion people on planet Earth, then the combined wealth of the top 100 the, the richest men whose names you find in uh, classified by Forbes and others would include, w w would equal or exceed the wealth of over three and a half billion people on the planet. And, and, and we see India as a classic case of one such country which has produced one out of three computer software engineers in the world and also accounts for one out of three persons on this planet who is poor and hungry and illiterate and malnourished. It's clearly not possible to sustain growth in a way in which it's also ecologically sustainable and improves the over well the, the the overall well-being of large sections of people on this planet uh, there, there there's there has been enough research on the subject to clearly show that in this race to continuously grow faster and faster and faster you would end up ignoring the well-being of a very substantial section of the population of this world that we live in. Let's look at just a, a few sets of facts. The United States of America with roughly 300 million people in a planet of over 7 billion accounts for less than 5%, uh, roughly 4% of the population of the planet. But even after the great recession, the national income of the United States of America, the GDP of the US at a little more than 15 trillion American dollars, is roughly a fourth of the GDP of the world. In other words, we have barely 4% of the population or 5% of the population consuming about a quarter of the planet's resources. And you take the world's two most populous countries, China and India. China and India together would account for close to 40% of the population on Earth. And these are the so-called emerging economies, the fastest growing economies. But as we talk, uh, at the end of 2014, the combined GDP of India and China put together would be roughly about a fifth or maybe a little more than a fifth of world's world GDP. Put differently, if every citizen of India and China started consuming like the average citizen of the United States of America, we would need two planets Earth, but we don't have two planets Earth, we just have one. This also implies that if India and China cannot show the way towards ecologically sustainable development and so-called growth, not just in material terms, but growth in terms of well-being and what 
has now been talked about, gross human happiness, then clearly uh, we cannot replicate the, uh, the economic uh, models and the economic paradigms and the economic uh, trajectories of the West, in particular the United States. So what has happened is, rather belatedly these two countries, uh, China and India, are starting, have realized that the future of the planet in a sense depends on the, the kind of way these two countries develop and how, how uh, say, say when you look at energy consumption, uh, the, the share of renewable energy to non-renewable energy, including hydrocarbons, all of these factors come in and we've seen how India and China have often replicated some of the worst practices, the worst patterns of consumption of energy and other natural resources. And, and clearly there is growing realization that that's, you can't just continue in that direction. You have to uh, change and, and you have to change soon. The sooner you do it, the better. If only this realization was dawning at a faster pace on our policymakers, our decision makers, those who are in positions of power and authority, then there would be some room for more optimism than at present because there still seems to be quite a few important people in these two countries, India and China, and I can certainly speak for India, who would continue to live in a state of denial about the impact of the way we intend growing, the way we have grown and the way we intend growing in the foreseeable future. The, the, the kind of way we've been consuming energy, the way we've been uh, consuming other non-renewable resources, the way these resources have been all allotted, the, the way these resources have been priced. And, and for India in particular, the use of petroleum hydrocarbons has become particularly important. For the last few years, India has been importing between three-fourths and eighty percent of the country's total requirements of crude oil. We've been importing close to a fifth or roughly a fifth of our total requirements of coal, despite the fact that we have substantial reserves of coal, even if those reserves are of relatively poor quality in term because it has high ash content. And we are also importing roughly 40% of our total requirements of gas. So all of these make it very, very clear that if you're looking at the problems or the challenges that confront 1.25 billion people in India, we are really looking at issues concerning food security and energy security. And, it, and we could debate what is more important and what is less important, but surely these are the two biggest challenges that confront India in the near future. Because what we do today and the way we move ahead is going to make a big difference to the lives of our children and their children. It's not just dependence on emergence, on energy. When you have such a large proportion of the population who don't have energy, who don't have access to elect electricity, the question becomes what kind of energy? How are you providing energy to large sections of the people? In particular, the poor who live in over 600,000 villages scattered across the country. What we have here is a rather belated recognition 
that we have to emphasize renewables or renewable sources of energy far more than we have done in the past. I think China emphasized renewable energy far before India did and India has woken up to the consequences of not having invested or emphasized the importance of renewable energy <clears throat> that we are we have a lot of catching up to do we have a long and a difficult journey ahead of us as a country we all know that you know there are the issues are many the issues are complex if you're going to take coal out of the ground below, there's an issue of the livelihoods of the people who live on that ground. If you, you're looking at reducing the consumption of firewood, people burning less fuel, and you want to replace that with, say, liquefied petroleum gas, then you also have to provide that liquefied petroleum gas. If you're looking at providing kerosene or superior kerosene oil to the poor and those who live in remote areas essentially for cooking and for lighting you have to do something about governance because a huge proportion of the kerosene which is priced far below the market rate is illegally diverted and because there's a huge differential in the price of the subsidized price of kerosene in comparison to the price of diesel or petrol, there's an incentive to adulterate and in the absence of adequate systems of governance, of checks and balances, of penalizing offenders, we have a situation where you are subsidizing a particular petroleum product the subsidies don't reach the intended beneficiaries and not only that they're not even used for the purpose they're meant for essentially cooking and lighting so when you look at energy security or changing the energy mix or changing the pattern of energy consumption in the country like india you very very complex political social and economic relationships you're, you're looking at power structures in different parts of the country. You're looking at the nexus between business and politics. You're looking at the nexus not only between business and politics, but business, politics, the bureaucracy, and even crime. And you're looking at the ways in which, even as you open up your economy, you don't put in place those checks and balances in the form of empowered regulatory authorities. So you have a series of scandals, one after the other, one of which entailed the cancellation of coal blocks that were allotted uh, between 1992 and 2010. And, and one, one decision, the Supreme Court of India said, all these coal blocks have been allotted in an illegal manner. And, and the people of India, especially the poor of India, are having to pay a very, very stiff price for the kind of cronyism, for the kind of venality that we have seen in the working of our political economy in the recent past. I agree it's not only happening in India, uh, it's happening to a lesser or a greater degree across the world. There is something called the resource curse, which is a phenomenon which is particularly prevalent in countries in the southern hemisphere, in countries that are developing, where resources, natural resources, mineral resources, the gifts of Mother Nature, instead of become a blessing, become a curse on local populations, in particular indigenous communities, contributing to their further immiserization, to their further exploitation. This is a phenomenon that 
has prevailed to a greater or a lesser degree in many many countries in the world uh, i can talk about india and i can talk about how there is a huge swath of territory in india as they say from the himalayas to the bay of bengal uh, over a fourth of the geographical area of this country from the temple of pashupati in kathmandu to the tirupati temple not very far from the bay of bengal and we see this huge area cutting through states like uttar pradesh bihar jharkhand bengal madhya pradesh chatisgarh orissa andhra pradesh maharashtra this is where these are the richest lands of india above the surface the flora the fauna below the surface of earth the earth the 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 mineral resources and it's certainly not a coincidence that this is also the part of india where we see left wing extremism at its peak this is where we see uh, some of the poorest of the poor living the richest lands and the poorest people and it speaks a lot of the way india has tried to quote unquote develop and quote unquote grow through allocation of these through allocation and pricing and exploitation of these natural resources it's clearly not sustainable it clearly can't go on the way we have uh, the problem is that without sounding unduly pessimistic the fact is we've been learning these lessons very slowly whether it's emphasis on renewables whether it is the whole issue of ensuring proper mining practices whether it's a issue of putting in place regulatory structures whether it's reducing the influence of cronyism whether it's the whole issue of following scientific practices uh, whether it's the whole issue of enforcing the law of the land in each and every one of these respects we surely haven't done very well we surely have to do much more and do it much better look even today in india and in across across the world there are many people who are in a state of denial as far as say, climate change is concerned they are even today unwilling to link the higher incidence of extreme weather situations to what has been happening you know across the world i hope that awareness i hope that awareness spreads faster than it has in the near future among the young in particular the youth of this country it's very very important i think it they also have to realize the inequities of the world you know i mean let's also accept that uh, we can't i mean we can't develop in a sustainable in an ecologically sustainable manner if we have to the kind of inequalities i mean, I mean look the the amount of uh, uh, food that is uh, wasted in the united states of america could feed a billion hungry people i mean there's one section of there's a billion people on the planet who are stuffed they are overweight they are eating far more than they should but there's also the other billion or a billion and a half people who are starved and then the whole political economy of food has to change how long can we continue to have a situation where every cow in europe receive government subsidies which would be equivalent to that cow traveling business class across the globe uh, once a year i mean how long can we have a situation where we have in the united states of america providing subsidies to barely 2% of its population call themselves farmers 
who essentially work for large agro-business conglomerates and a world where half your population, where three and a half billion people, you have 2% of 300 million people in the US and you have half the population on the planet dependent directly and indirectly on their livelihood on farming, on cultivation of the land. And, and the US is the only country in the world which has a higher proportion of its population behind bars at any point of time than the number of people who farm, who work on the land. Which is not so with the rest of the world. So we can't have continue in this way. We've seen a complete breakdown in negotiations in bodies like the World Trade Organization. But at some point of time, unless better sense prevails, uh, we'd be moving in a direction where things could get worse. But I, maybe I'm hopeful that whether it be countries like India or China, we learn to replicate and assimilate knowledge in the form of best practices from across the globe. We followed many of the worst practices from across the globe. Maybe we learn as we move on. We surely have to learn faster. And if we don't learn, then we are doomed. So I hope we learn and I hope we learn faster. And more importantly, I hope our children learn. Whether it be waste of food, waste of material, use of energy, all of these use of water, use of land. I mean, let, let, let's look, if India can't show the world how to better utilize land, then things are terrible. Why? Sure, I mean, we're here, here in India, a country of 1.25 billion people living in barely 2.5% of the geographical area of the planet, but we have 17% of the population living in 2.5% of the land area. So if India cannot show the way in better utilization of land and water. Asia is the most uh, water short continent on the planet. It has many, many implications. It has geopolitical in implications. The importance of the Tibetan plat plateau is just one example because the Tibetan plateau itself is a, the source of some of the biggest river systems on the planet. I mean, th these are the, the wars of the future. Yes, there may be some missiles, there may be some bombs, but the wars of the future are really over the uh, battles for control over natural resources, over water, over oil, over coal. And I don't know how long uh, we will continue with the situation as we are talking at the end of November 2014 where we've seen a sharp fall in prices of crude petroleum oil between June and November prices have come crashing down from $115 a barrel to around $80 a barrel or less than $80 a barrel how long can we go on this way and, and there are all kinds of conspiracy theories. And yes, the United States has emerged as the world's biggest producer, consumer, and importer of energy. But the whole shale gas phenomenon, which has made the United States of America uh, it's, uh, more energy secure than ever before, how long it can be ecologically sustainable, that, that whole fracking process and the utilization of water. And more importantly, whether other parts of the world can continue in the same way, even as we not just extract shale oil and shale gas, but go deeper and deeper into the belly of Mother Earth and deep under the oceans to drill and dig for more oil and for gas. So clearly many people believe and I have no reason to disbelieve them that we've peaked 
and uh, if we can't now change the way we consume energy then the future of humanity is bleak but i'm not a pessimist you know sometimes the old saying about the darkest hour being just before the dawn maybe things are so bad that we possibly can't get worse than where we are today and maybe we'll learn to move a move forward a little better a little uh more we we'll be a little more concerned and act appropriately for the sake of our children and our grandchildren it is uh, these multiple crises that you see are a consequences of not understanding the consequences of the way we are claiming we are developing where as you yourself have pointed out growth is the, is become the new religion it's actually in a sense worse than the way marx saw religion as the opium of the masses and the hope for the hopeless it's an obsession which is going to lead us downhill i mean it's going to create many more problems than it solves and i think the sooner we realize it the better i i i think it's a very appropriate analogy the cancerous growth within a human body and the obsession with growth of gross domestic product at a national level i would go along with you i would say that uh, what are the reasons that have caused cancer there are many reasons why people have cancerous growths in their body and one of them is the inability to eat in a healthy manner it's because they indulge themselves it's because of their inability to distinguish between their greed and their need human needs are very very peculiar a man who has no shirt wants one after he's got one he wants two and then he wants five and then he wants 10 and some of us cannot distinguish between uh need and our greed i understand they might need a museum to keep all the shoes that imelda marcos owns it has been alleged that ramalinga raju of hyderabad had so many suits uh, many of them the armani brand that would take him more than 2 years to wear each suit at least once and that would include a few sundays so what is true for the individual is true for society as a whole and communities as a whole so if we as individuals fail to distinguish between our need and the greed our need and our greed we are actually regressing we are moving back in time and what is true of each and every one of us is true for society as a whole if a mother or a father allows a child to only have ice cream and potato chips because that's what the child loves the most and not rice and bread and dal and vegetables and whatever else then that's the surest way to ensure that your child grows up in a healthy manner i think all of us realize this but nevertheless we are often in a state of denial and what is true for each one of us as individuals when we fail to distinguish between our need and greed manifests itself in the way our societies our communities our nation states our continents have been developing